Hello, my name's Helen and I'm the Associate Principal Flute with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. And we're here today in the beautiful grounds of Holyrood Park next to St Margaret's Lock. And we're here to have a chat today with the soloist in Beethoven's fourth piano concerto, Stephen Osborne. Hi Stephen. Hello. Thanks for agreeing to meet us. Lovely. And did you order this weather? Thanks. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. Listen, before we start talking about um, the um, Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto, heartfelt congratulations on your recent OBE award. That's absolutely you. fantastic. You must be thrilled. Yeah, I was. You know, your dedication to music and what you've done for the music world is fantastic. So, heartfelt Thanks. congratulations. So, Beethoven's Fourth Piano Concerto. I was doing a little bit of reading about it and it, it, it was strange to me that it, it sat for a number of years on the shelf having no one to play it and then when it actually it got its first private premiere in actual fact Beethoven himself ended up playing the piano and then in the, he also had to conduct Symphony Number no. 4 which was also a premiere and I just wonder what is it like to direct from the piano yourself, to, to, to not have a conductor, to not necessarily be led? And, and, and how, how is that going to work with you and Sharon? Are you, have you, are you going to kind of co-direct or is it Am just... I going to wave my hands? Yeah, are you going to wave your hands? I'm not going <laughs> to wave my hands. Yeah, I'm, I love doing concertos without conductor. Certainly this kind of concerto where, I mean, actually the character of the piece is so sort of collegial anyway. It's yeah, not... Yeah. Except for the middle movement, it's not one of these things where the orchestra and piano are fighting. Um, and I don't know, I think people listen in a different way, like the orchestra players. Well, and me too, when you're not going through the conductor. It suits the way that I like to make music, which is this it's sort of really trying to find this communal space and the fight to find the feeling together. And to do that, you need to listen very closely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward very yeah, much. Yeah, and I guess uh, that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about as well as about the characters of this concerto and in, in that Beethoven went, you know, he clearly knew he was going deaf, yet we have this image of this incredibly successful composer. So, you know, he, he has that kind of agitation of turmoil within himself and yet this persona of, of, br of brilliance and success and and, and for me, it's just really interesting how he manages to write such beautifully lyrical melodies, mm. and yet in, internally he's in turmoil. And I just wonder when you start uh, when you start to learn a piece, you know, how do you look at the characters? Is the background of the composer really important as the way you approach looking at particular characters within a piece, or, or is it just l literally note learning and then? you start to explore those I mean, things. I've always started just with the character of the piece. Because I think, well, for example, if you have that, let's say, the last sonata by a composer, Beethoven, Schubert, whoever, it's very easy to think what's the last one, it's some summation. But of course, it might have lived another 10 years. So I think one can get kind of taken down rabbit holes if you go, if you sort of start from things that are outside the piece. Because um, to me, the challenge is how do you how do you bring a piece of music really vividly to life so that it's not, um, it's not pretending to be anything that's not? And yeah. again, going back to, like, say, last sonatas of Beethoven Schubert, easily you could think this has to sound profound, but profound has got nothing to do with it. You know, profound is not an emotion. <laughs> yeah. How do you find the emotion in the piece? When I'm learning something, I just try and find what's it saying to me, what seems to be the truest thing, because it feels to me that let's say, on you that I haven't got any background in music particularly, just there is this very natural human ability to tell when something's sincere and when it's not. Yeah, absolutely. And that still works through music. And so I'm trying to find the sincerest thing I can. And I find that when I find that, that the audience goes quiet. I observe that with other people playing as well, yeah. that when I feel like there's something false about it, I can feel the audience being restless. Yeah. And when it seems sincere, I feel like the audience yeah gets drawn in that's the magic really the music like how that happens you know yeah. this sense of kind of being on the edge of your seat because something's vital has been communicated yeah. somehow really, that's really powerful so it's, it's it's about genuine beauty actually isn't it it's about you telling a story when I was in my 20s I was very concerned with everything being beautiful uh -huh. and then gradually it felt to me that it reminds me of when I was at music college and when I was in the RNCM in Manchester and this, there was uh, concrete staircases that were sort of very resonant. And whenever the singers 
went up the staircases, they would sing mm. because the sound was so wonderful mm. Mm. and beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, beauty easily is actually a distraction somehow. Mm. Some characters are full of beauty and some are very kind of, or the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's just a question like, what, what does the music feel like? What's it saying? How do you yeah. bring that to life? And I guess actually that question came about because the tragedy of this piece for me is that I don't get to play it very often because mm. there's only one flute. And so in re-listening to it, I was, you know, I'm so often when I'm in the orchestra, I, I hear the music, but I don't really truly hear it because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of caught up and bound by what's in front of me. And actually what, what was, I, and I guess the reason I use the word beautiful is because I listen to it in a very different way. And some of, mm. some of this concerto is absolutely sublime. It's an incredibly beautiful piece. The first movement especially, I would say. Yeah. But it's funny with Beethoven, often there's these very striking contrasts that are not easy to bring together in your mind. So there's this amazingly lyrical first movement. I mean, it has its moments of drama, but basically a very lyrical character. And then this middle movement, which is so conflicted. And you wonder, well, where does that come from? Mm. How do you follow that first movement with this? Mm which is this, like, the most, uh, I mean, it's an incredibly dramatic structure of this sort of opposition between piano and orchestra. Orchestra, very aggressive, piano, very, well, I don't know, there's so many words you could put to what the piano's doing. And then, and then the last movement, which kind of becomes this kind of frolic, almost, doesn't it, yeah. and a delight. And, it's com com and again, I, I, I guess it made me think about the turmoil that Beethoven would have been going through. In yeah. that, you know, he has this, there's this juxtaposition of, you know, frivolity and, and happiness, and, and then there's all this, also this very sombre, intimate sadness, actually, as well, and it, it, it's very much characterised in this, in this concerto. Yeah, I mean, it's really part, one of the greatest aspects of his genius, like, of these, how he puts these things together and how he makes the, the whole, more than some of its parts, to yeah. use the cliche, and yeah. oft, but often in quite provocative ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do these things belong together? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Just one other thing before we leave it, actually, Stephen. Are you going to use Beethoven cadenzas, or do you sometimes feel that you would like to write your own, have your own? I have written my own for, for the first and second concertos, I wrote my own. The cadenza for this one's so incredible. So there, there's two cadenzas he wrote for the first movement, and there's one in the last movement. And uh, I, I couldn't do anything even remotely close to what Beethoven does in the first movement. In the first concerto, I wrote my own because well, we are better than three for that one. Um, and I don't know why, I just had this instinct. I know why I want to do my own thing. And then in the second concerto, the cadenza was written much later and it's so out of style. Yeah. It's getting much later style, this kind of fugal thing that he does in his later music. And I just don't like it. Yeah, yeah. I don't, for me, it doesn't fit. Yeah. So I decided to, to do my own cadenza for that too. Right, brilliant. That's lovely. Okay, Stephen, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and get some of your insight into Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. Thank you very much for sharing those with us. You're welcome. And thanks to you too for joining us for this concert. Now I'll return you back to the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall for the second half of the concert. Thank you.